Hello everyone and welcome to a special edition of Slash Film Daily. On this episode we're going to have a spoiler-filled discussion of Ari Aster's new film Midsummer or Midsummer. I'm not entirely certain what the correct pronunciation there is there. I'm sure all of us are going to have our, our own ways of talking about this movie. Uh, and then you're going to hear my interviews with Ari Aster and with actors Will Poulter and Jack Rayner. My name is Ben Pearson. I'm the senior writer at SlashFilm.com and joining me on today's show are Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. And writers Huay Tran Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Real quickly, Ben, this is the one with Mysterio, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think we're going to be doing a, uh, a spoiler discussion of Spider-Man Far From Home sometime soon. But this is a much different movie, Jacob. This is a, uh, a brightly lit horror film, Ari Aster's follow-up to last year's Hereditary. I know that some of us have talked about this on previous episodes of The Water Cooler already, but HT, you just saw this movie last night, so uh, I guess you can do maybe like a, a spoiler-free reaction if you want, but pretty quickly we're going to dive into spoilers, so um, what did you think about this? I love this movie. I was a big fan of Hereditary last year, but I think Midsummer uh, appealed to me specifically much more than Hereditary. I, I, I loved it. Um, more than that film. And uh, it's the most intense, uh, grotesque in breakup movie that I've ever seen. And it's surprisingly funny. It's, uh, you know, near a comedy at some points. And uh, because of the um, the folk horror elements and the fact that this film takes place in broad daylight, there's this uh, perverse Lee that goes into it and uh, I really enjoyed that and um, it was uh, near cathartic at the end as well I've almost found it, the ending to be almost kind of a happy ending in some senses uh, and uh, I love that it's um, a commentary on toxic relationships and uh, gaslighting and everything and I uh, was I'm just so happy to call this probably one of my favorite films of the year so far. Wow, yeah, that's high praise. So, guys, let's just jump right into spoilers. So if, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Midsummer yet, I would highly encourage you to do that. It's certainly not a movie for everybody. This is not going to be um, something that we could like recommend across the board. Uh, it's very dependent on your taste, whether you're going to react properly or, or uh, positively, I should say, to this film. But... Um, Man, this is, uh, it's one hell of a movie, that's for sure. So, Jacob, I want to hear from you. What what do you make of, uh, I mean, you know, with all spoilers on the table, what do you make of the messages of this of this film and, and maybe um, how you compare it to Hereditary? It's so fascinating to talk about this because after the movie, I saw it early screening and I saw it at the Alma Draft House and the highball, the, the attached bar nearby, it was spilled out there for a post-screening, uh, you know, event. And opinions were flying, and people had very different reactions based on their own life experiences. And one of the most common things I saw was, was women explaining to men what they missed uh, in Florence Pugh's main character in ways that I found illuminating and fascinating because uh, there were things that I flat out didn't catch on. Uh, I mean, for Hereditary, for me, that film resonated strongly because the idea of unwanted family baggage haunting you is something that really connected with me. Whereas I've never had a breakup as bad as the one depicted uh, so brutally in Midsommar. Uh, so there were certain elements and aspects that weren't cathartic for me, but were for so many other people. So I had to you know, appreciate that element from afar. So I had to look at the film strictly as a horror film, not as an experience that spoke to me in a personal level. And I think as a horror film, it works brilliantly. And even though the aesthetic is all you know 1970s Wicker Man, it really reminded me more of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, except that instead of the except at the end with the lead girl jumping out the window, getting on a car, truck and driving away to safety, it ends with the girl saying, you know what, these are my people, <laughs> and saying, I, I, I really like um, what, these, what this cult has to say, and I found my family. And to me, that was both disturbing and funny and really surprising. And I like the idea that it's maybe a companion hereditary, and they're both about family dysfunction or family history. But whereas Hereditary is about how we ignore that, uh, Midsommar is about how we embrace that. But I want to hear, everybody's talking about their breakup aspects. Uh, Chris, did, did, as, as a man, did, did the ending speak to you in a way it perhaps didn't speak to me? Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually, I agree with HT in that I, I also thought it was a very uh, happy ending. I, I this, this movie is really weird to me because I did not find it as disturbing as a lot of people are saying it is i mean it has disturbing stuff in it but 
I don't know. I I found I thought this movie was like so much fun, and I don't know if that says more about me <laughs> than the movie. But like I had a like a like this, this to me was almost like a feel good movie, even with all the horrible stuff that happens. It's so funny, and it's so not like light hearted because it's not. But the movie is so much on Florence Pooh's side, like from the from the get go, from beginning to end, that. There's never a moment where I was like concerned for her. I guess that's how I can put it. Like, you know, there was never a moment where I was like, "Uh oh, she's in danger." Like, I realized everyone else in this movie is in danger because they're all terrible men and they all pretty much get what's coming to them. And there was not like a moment where I was like worried that something bad was going to happen to her. Even when you know the movie kept trying to make it seem like, "Uh oh, something's going to happen to her character," I was always like, sort of like, "She's going to be okay" because this movie is really on her side and i i really like that i also to jump back to the breakup element i really <laughs> i'm really curious about ari oster as a person now because you know uh you know before the screening he was like you know i wrote this while i was going through a breakup and i'm like is he relating himself to the male character if so he sees himself as like a complete asshole and i can appreciate that because i also see myself as a complete piece of shit sometimes so i thought that was a really <laughs> interesting thing that this guy would be this willing to be self-exploratory you know I'm, I'm assuming he's basing the male character on himself i could be wrong but if he is i i kind of appreciate that this guy was willing to be so self-deprecating in terms of how you know, uh, guys can be, you know, so toxic and so prone to gaslighting in relationships. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing. HT, do, do you think that Jack Rayner's character, Christian, that he deserves what he got at the end of this movie? Like, the, the film ends with uh, the cult members um, carving out a bear carcass and, like, uh, paralyzing him and putting him in this bear carcass and then putting him in a building with some of the other... Uh, people who have been killed and like lighting the entire thing on fire as everybody just like stands there and, and watches this whole thing burn to the ground. So do you think that's like a, a um, I, I think that's, that's one of the central questions that this movie is trying to ask. And, and you'll hear in the interviews in a little bit um, what a few of the people mentioned as like what they're trying to get is like that feeling of catharsis that you mentioned HT, but also mm -hmm. having this thing in the back of your head where it's like, does this punishment fit the crime? So I'm curious what you think about that. Well, I don't know if it's a question of whether he deserves it, but if we are in the headspace of uh, Florence Pugh's character, Danny, then he definitely deserves it. I feel like it's more on an allegorical scale. Um, she taking this toxic, abu like emotionally abusive relationship in which she has been uh, crushed by all the emotional labor that she has been um, undergoing just to keep this relationship alive and taking that and burning it away in a very literal sense but i i felt it was more of a it, it, this film kind of speaks on a fable level to me um and this is something i was thinking about actually in that a lot of you know fables and fairy tales are horror movies or horror stories at their core and and they always spoke to some sort of greater societal fear, um, if you think of old fairy tales or um, tales of the boogie monster, for example, they are warding away or warning of some some danger in real life. And in this case, um, Midsummer is warning of the dangers of those toxic relationships and seeing that happy ending uh, come to fruition through that little, bur little burning away of this relationship, that throwing aside of it. So on a metaphorical level, <laughs> Yes, he deserves it. Uh, as a person, I'm sure, you know, he is a victim, as are everyone else who was in, uh, who came into this cult without knowing exactly what would go in, the outsiders who came into this without knowing what would happen. But um, in relation to Danny's story, he definitely deserved that um that punishment. <laughs> yeah, and the the fairy tale thing is interesting too because the movie opens with this um I don't know what you would call it like a tapestry kind of thing where there's uh all these etchings and and drawings and all of this uh, symbolism and stuff like that that that's sort of uh, baked throughout the whole movie 
you can kind of tell what's going to happen before it happens. The movie seems like explicitly designed to clue you in to what kind of film you're watching that way. Like, for example, there's this um, in, in one of the apartment scenes really early on. I noticed that there's a, a poster or something like a, a framed print hanging on the wall that is of this little girl wearing a crown kissing a bear um, above I think Florence Pugh's character when she's sort of like laid out. And obviously that's something that sort of like literally comes to fruition throughout, you know, over the course of this film. So I think those fairy tale elements are, are definitely there and like scattered throughout. Um, Jacob, I'm curious, I guess, before we uh, end our spoiler discussion, were, were there any things, uh, any conversations that you had or, or um, observations that you overheard at that uh post-screening event that particularly stood out to you, like uh, illuminating ones, you m maybe from the female audience that you just completely missed? Any specifics there? Uh, the one thing I kept on noticing, and my wife had had a conversation with, with two uh, separate men, which was both men did not buy Florence Pugh smiling at the end and mm -hmm. finding catharsis in her moment, and my wife having to um, very gently say, uh, lay out the subtext of her finding healing in that moment because i i think a, a lot of men subconsciously are not you know maybe don't necessarily clue into jack rayner's character being a complete piece of shit because what the movie kind of wisely does is that it positions jack rayner's character next to will poulter's character will poulter is this almost comical cartoonish ugly american whereas jack rayner's character is far more relatable i mean you I mean, even spend i you even spend stretches in the movie thinking he's maybe a not a bad guy, he's in the wrong relationship, but it's he keeps on. The movie paints him as a, as a very realistic portrait of a guy who's up, who's no good, but it doesn't doesn't hammer you over the head with it. It kind of insidiously slips it in there to the point where you realize almost too late in the picture, oh god, this guy's no good. He's a bad dude, but in a way, it's so you understand why somebody could be with him for years on end in a relationship and maybe not realize that he's bad for them. So I think that men like me, are going to be in for a wake-up call and they start realizing that uh, this movie is a very, very um, uh, fiery in, in its portrayal of the casually bad boyfriend and casually bad partner. And I think a lot of men are going to see themselves in that character in in a way that makes them uncomfortable. And I, I know it certainly did for me. Yeah. That... I also want to add, um, sorry, uh, something that to this conversation in terms of why Florence Pugh's character would uh, so embrace being part of this community that has basically terrorized her for the past I don't know, couple days. And I think it stems in that one scene in which she uh, spies uh, Jack Rayner's character, Christian, undergoing the, the uh, I don't know what kind of, how you would describe that, right? The, the, the sex the scene. The wild like, sex scene. That's like one of the, the craziest moments scene. of 2019 and she, on film. <laughs> yeah, and she breaks down in tears. And um, while she's screaming in agony, uh, she, the other women surround her and start to share her pain. And I think that idea of the sharing of the pain, the sharing of that emotional labor is something that's so um, uh, profound to what women in real life do uh, with in regards to relationships, breakups, any sort of uh, grief or hardship that we go through, women do tend to work in communities and um, share that kind of pain more and be more open to those sort of um, back and forths about that kind of those these uh, hardships. So I think that that was kind of the, the part where she starts to embrace them and starts to realize that uh, she belongs here. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. I, I think I sort of like um, internalized that, but couldn't quite intellectualize it in the way that you just did. So I'm glad that you said that. Um, I guess let's do just final thoughts on the movie or, or if there's any other um, moments or, or specific imagery or anything like that that you guys want to call out. I think this is probably going to be our last chance to do any sort of spoiler heavy discussion. So um, Chris, was there anything from you that uh, that really stood out to you that we haven't talked about yet? I mean, really, it's just I'm I'm so taken by how funny this movie is and i said that earlier and I, I i really can't get over it because i can't remember the last time i saw a horror movie that's so <laughs> comfortable with being funny like you know all most horror movies have moments of levity and they'll have one or two or even like more than that scenes of, of comic relief but 
the comedy in this film is is persistent to the point where like I would almost call this like a horror comedy more than just a horror movie. And I'm really curious on how that's going to play with a lot of general audiences, because as, as we've learned through sites like, you know, cinema scores, stuff like that audiences are kind of dumb and they, they don't, <laughs> they don't appreciate being, I don't want to say tricked, but you know, th- this movie is very much being sold as a horror movie. You know, all the trailers are like from the director of hereditary. And I'm not saying it's not a horror movie. It absolutely is, but it's so unapologetically funny that I'm so curious to see how angry this movie makes people because it's not, <laughs> it's not like being subtle about being funny. It, it, and I can even tell like when at the screening I saw it with that there were people who weren't sure if they were supposed to be laughing or not. Like, 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 like I, you know, I, I was laughing nonstop, but I, I got the feeling that there were audience members at this screening who were just like, is this supposed to be funny? What's, what's going on here? And I, I have a feeling that's, going to be a a big reaction from a lot of people who go into this thinking you know oh it's a scary movie and they're they're not going to really know what they're getting and i'm i'm kind of dreading that reaction because it it makes me furious but at the same time i i have to appreciate the movie for committing to not really giving a shit about about that that concern yeah what i really like about the the comedy in this movie too is that it's not really there to provide that levity or that um that fresh air from just the horror and the dread that uh, pervades the rest of this film. It's part of that sort of perverse nature of this movie uh, that's kind of in line with the daylight in which this takes place. It lends an almost eerie, um, unnerving air to this because the horror, the comedy is as unsettling as the horror is in my opinion. Yeah, that's a good point too. Um, Jacob, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, I know when we have our end of the year discussion about best moments of the year. We're going to have this, the whole sex scene discussion, but I'm going to uh, go ahead and put it out there now that I'm also going to argue for the uh, cliff suicide scene with the sledgehammer and all that uh, gory stuff, because it, it, it kind of uh, is the most horrifying moment of the movie. And it happens early, which is surprising. And just the way it's filmed and the way everyone reacts to it. Uh, and the way it kind of plays out in this kind of eerie silence, uh, the movie, the most unsettling moment in a movie that frequently is very funny is discussed. So I want to shout out to the, how well executed the gore in that scene was. What about you, HC? Any final moments or final thoughts uh, rather? These, this is a, an, a, a topic that I don't have the ability to unpack, but I want to, to sort of point out the treatment of the people of color in this movie. And I thought that was really interesting because there are people of color and they're the ones that um, end up being picked off first in favor of the more Nordic looking characters. And um, I don't have enough insight into this uh, topic to say anything eloquently on it, but I thought it was really interesting that, you know, this is a very Nordic Swedish looking community and they're all blonde and fair. And um, the people of color in this film um, are obvious outsiders, and it's sort of a. I feel like there's some social social commentary going on that I can't quite put my finger on, but I just wanted to uh, point that out. Yeah, I'm glad you did because that reminds me that uh, when I was taking notes watching um, this movie, I, I wrote down in my notes and never really came back to revisit it that um, the idea of Christian Jack Rayner's character taking his thesis idea from William Jackson Harper's character is just like mm-hmm. straight up appropriation. Like that that is. That's another th- another way that this movie um, sort of literalizes that concept, and I'm sure, like you said, you know, somebody is going to write an editorial about this that is um, eloquent and and fascinating. But maybe it's not going to be us. But um, but yeah, I, I noticed that sort of um, idea like bubbling right beneath the surface of this film too. So. Um, All right, I think that's going to do it for our discussion. Now I'm going to play my interview with writer-director Ari Aster. Congratulations on the movie. This is uh, a really (laughs) amazing piece of work. Oh, thank you. So your first shot in this movie is this artwork that sort of depicts all of these rituals, and it it sort of uh, slides away as the movie begins, almost like a curtain pulling back to begin a play. Where did that idea come from for you? Um... That actually occurred to me in post-production. I just, I, I, you know, the film has always been like a fairy tale for me, and I, I, uh, got excited by the idea of sort of um, 
laying out the framework uh, of the film before we even begin it. Um, if anything, that felt it felt like it it uh, it would uh, orient or orientate um, the uh, the viewer in the right way mm-hmm. to sort of uh, take in this film on its own terms. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I, I commissioned this. Uh, Brilliant contemporary artist Mu Pan um, to uh, to to make that tapestry mural, yeah. um, and uh, and uh, I'm 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 really pleased with what with what he he did. Yeah, there's that sense of like uh, maybe not full on voyeurism in a traditional sense, but the sense of being on the outside looking in is something that you seem to return to over and over in your work. Like Hereditary, you see that idea in this in the dioramas in that film, for example, and like the and he this this film we see it in this uh, dollhouse style structure almost where these characters sleep in, in Midsummer. And what is it that about that idea, the outside looking in, that kind of resonates with you as a storyteller uh, I don't know um, gosh I don't know if I I mean it was easier to talk about with hereditary because there were um, thematic ideas at play um, that we were that were kind of being applied aesthetically whereas here um, I guess, you know, again, I've always seen the film as a fairy tale, and I've always seen the film as being this perverse wish fulfillment fantasy. Um, and I and so there's this sort of agreement with the with the audience coming in, like they're coming in to see a folk horror movie. Mm-hmm. And so we all know, or most of us know, the the traditions there, you know, most of us know the Wicker Man either by reputation or because we've seen the film, and so we know. Okay, so uh, Americans are going to this 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 other, you know this other country, and if we've and if 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 we've seen one horror film, we've seen them all. They're going to be killed off one by one, um, and they're they're going to be sacrificed. Um, and so for me, like the pleasure of making the film is not in like focusing on those things. Those those things are inevitable. Um, and uh, and so it's it's not about it's not about like you know how am I going to kill this guy off or how am I going to kill that guy off that's all very banal for me mm-hmm. and not very interesting uh, but it's about how 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 am I going to get exactly where we all know I'm going because if I don't go there it's going to be dissatisfying um, uh, because there is that contract um, but how am I going to get there in a way that. Uh, that reveals this to be some, some something else, and, if, and so for me, the film is there are two films happening here. For the men in the film, for the American men, this is a folk horror movie. Mm-hmm. For the main character, for Florence Pugh's character, this is uh, a wish fulfillment fan, a, a fantasy. Mm-hmm. And so, in the same way, Horga, this community. I want this to feel like this rich, lived-in place that has, you know, deep traditions and, and, and a, long, a long history, and, and, and I want those details to be very rich. Um, but at the same time, they all exist for Danny, for the main character. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in that way, the movie itself kind of exists for Danny. Like it, the the trajectory exists for Danny, mm-hmm. and there's something. It's it, and so there is fun to be had in being self conscious about that. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's my circuitous way of kind of answering <laughs> your question. Uh, a lot of filmmakers talk about how the editing room is where they find the movie, and you've written and directed both of your features. So, did you have that sense of discovery in post production, or was it sort of more of a straightforward? Thing than that because you've had the ideas of these films in your head since when you originally wrote the script. Sorry, the question is: is did, I... did you did you find the film in post production? No. Well, <coughs> you find the shape of the film in post production. Uh, the original cut was three hours and forty five minutes, um, and that's not like exclusive to my films. I think most. Most films are like unwieldy when you first put them together, and they're much longer. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and so and the way I work too is that I don't typically get traditional coverage and some scenes I will um, when it's appropriate but if I can if I can make a scene like live for a long time in one master I like to just do that and not give myself anything to lean on yeah um, I find that it allows me to like really focus on the aesthetics in a way that kind of to, to have no way out forces me to really commit to cho- choices that you know I uh, I tend to not regret. Yeah. And sometimes you do regret them. Sometimes you re- you you absolutely regret not getting options. Um, but um, but what happens when you do that is that you have to be really careful and post production can become like a torture for a little while uh, because you have scenes where your only option is to cut at a certain point. Mm-hmm. Or it is, uh, otherwise, your film will be loud lousy with jump cuts yeah um and so again this is a long-winded way of saying that i i i I tend to find a new shape for the films in post-production but the trick is how do i retain the shape of the script and the shape of what i intended to do um and how do i like you know how to choose what details are extraneous and, mm-hmm. what, and what details are valuable, even if they aren't pushing the story along. Um, and so it, it becomes a negotiation. And uh, um, But, I mean, every step in the process is one of discovery. Uh, it's a really... It's... it's, it's, all, it, it's And this one was particularly punishing because we... we uh, we had very little po- um, um, pre- pre- pre-production time because mm-hmm. I was split between finishing Hereditary, doing Hereditary Press, and uh, having about two months of pre-production during which we had to build the entire right. community from, from scratch. And that includes cultivating the land because when we first found that field, the grass was taller than I was. Mm. And, uh, and that includes uh, creating a path through the woods that would lead to this field. Um, so we had no time to build it, and then we had we had a very tight, intensive uh, uh, production schedule. Mm-hmm. We did not have nearly enough time to do what we did, mm-hmm. and uh, and then um, you know we finished shooting in uh, October, and the movie's coming out now, and so uh, go just we 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 really had to sprint through the cut and then through vi- vi- visual effects and the score and, and yeah. you know uh, sound and it, so um, if anything it's about trying to uh, just kind of maintain a, a certain amount of like focus mm-hmm. and integrity even while you know the the deadlines are kind of you know um, just uh, approaching yeah, yeah. Are, are encroaching and are as punishing as they could be uh, you mentioned multiple cuts and I I'd actually heard a rumor that your preferred cut was a little bit longer than the theatrical one is that true and, and what may have been in that that didn't quite make it well I would say my preferred cut <coughs> would have been maybe 25 minutes longer but that I actually feel that this cut is the most accessible cut mm-hmm. so there probably will exist a director's cut and I would not actually call the director's cut necessarily better I would say this is the cut with scenes that were very painful for me to cut that I might have not cut if I weren't you know uh, encouraged to keep pushing um, but um, but this is definitely like an approved cut yeah you know um, I, 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 I I had final cut on the film and I'm very proud of what we arrived at mm-hmm. um, but yes I would say the three hour and 45 minute cut I would never want anybody to watch <laughs> um, and there is probably a, I would say there's a two hour and 45 minute cut without credits that um, that I would be interested in hearing what people thought cool yeah hopefully we get a chance to check that out someday um Let's talk a little bit about the ending of the movie, and I'll put a spoiler warning here for people who may not have, have seen it yet, but the film builds to this really incredible crescendo, first with Christian's sex scene, which is somehow both horrifying and kind of hilarious at the same time. How did you strike that balance in such a vulnerable moment for these characters? 
Um, again, I'm, I'm not sure how I did anything in that, you know, I'm, I, I'm kind of going by my gut um, for a, a lot of this stuff. Uh, I would say um, I, I was going for a sort of toxic catharsis that we are going for, like the, that the end is designed to be very cathartic because mm-hmm. we've established a dynamic and we have, you know, the movie does a lot of work to align you with w- one half of this relationship and so there is then like this punishment that's laid out for the other half mm-hmm. um, that should feel cathartic because again you've been kind of against him through the movie uh, but it should be something that kind of catches in the throat and, and that maybe uh, in the moment feels invigorating and, and, and maybe in retrospect one would have to wonder like is it entirely justified yeah but I think that's something that's kind of magical and also dangerous about movies is that you can really, you can manipulate people to really, 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 uh, to, to, to become kind of bloodthirsty. Yeah. Um, it's almost like hypnotic. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and uh, if anything, I, there, was a, there was fun to be had in... Um, kind of going like well over the top yeah in like kind of delivering the goods in a way that maybe could be seen as uh, slightly poisonous in, in retrospect um, but you you take uh, it sorry, seems like we gotta wrap okay Thanks. it seems like you take pleasure in that though sort of standing off on the sideline almost like ambitiously like watch you know like mm-hmm. twisting with people and, and sort of like like Danny's final smile in the movie is this really fascinating thing because it it's almost like giving the audience permission to feel okay with what happens to Christian in a way. Uh, I would say if I I do like, I often find myself watching the, the last sequence of this film and I find myself like laughing. Uh, so I, I do, I do find it funny. Um, even in just what it's doing, um, there's something funny about it for me. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I uh, I'm I'm always interested to hear how how people feel after the film. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks very much for your time, man. I appreciate Thank you. It. Congratulations again on the film. Thanks very much. Okay, now let's jump over to my interview with actor Will Poulter, who plays Mark. I heard that Ari was terrified of bugs and basically wore like kind of like a beekeeper suit on the on the set sometimes to protect himself. There's a moment early in this movie where your character is really worried about bugs as well mm. and as he's like walking through the grass. Mm. I was wondering if that was like an improv shout out to Ari or if that was actually in the script. I wish it was an improv. I wish I could take that credit. But um, actually the, the real um, and truthful answer is that Ari does such an amazing job of infusing all of his characters with real life sort of experiences um, that yeah that that was that was one of the I think only things about Mark to, as, um, aside from a dark sense of humor that um, actually you know um, is true of Ari himself mm-hmm. uh, Ari told me that some of his neuroses were, were going to be um, you know embodied by by Mark and um, the bug thing yeah I was definitely channeling Ari Aster but under his direction right um, yeah I, w- I wish I'd I wish I'd had that presence of mind but no Ari told me this is uh, a really intense movie but your character is a little bit less intense than some of the ones that you've played recently and I was right. just wondering if that was part of the appeal to this uh, of this project for you like the idea of not having to go to quite such dark places as an mm. actor you know I think the reason that I gravitated towards Mark although he's the sort of individual that I actually try not to resemble in, in my everyday life because I think he's, he's very problematic and um, and uh, yeah kind of uh Regressive in lots of ways. Um, he appealed to me because he still felt authentic. Mm. He felt like a character that I had interacted with, that I that I knew, that I think, unfortunately, everyone knows maybe too many of, or mm-hmm. have come into contact with too many of them. So it was just an authenticity to him that I responded to, um, and I kind of wanted to embody him um, in an effort to sort of like hold him up as sort of you know what you kind of laugh at but you don't laugh with. Right. Um, that was kind of the the interesting challenge presented to me by by playing Mark and like everything in Ari Aster's movies you know um, 
they're all rich with detail and with um, you know a lot of kind of research and hard work behind them and so to, to have a part in kind of just sort of pushing that over the line was was great. Like Mark was 90% complete, you know, I think on the page. Mm. Um, and Ari, you know, had a very intimate understanding of his psychology. So um, I really just was kind of the mouthpiece for, for what Ari had written. Mm -hmm. And once everybody arrives at the commune, Mark sort of seems like the most oblivious of the bunch to yes. a degree. He, there, yeah. There's a scene where he unintentionally, but literally like pisses on the traditions of his yes. hosts. So yes. what kind of conversations did you and Ari have about that sequence, that moment? I think we both agreed that in all the instances where Mark kind of appears insensitive or he's just like actively detracting from what's around him, um, we had agreed upon this idea that um, he lacked a certain amount of emotional intelligence and um, a, a certain amount of kind of um, observation or ability to observe things, you know, uh, and, and um, on an intellectual level. Mm -hmm. um, and the, his sort of capacity for cultural variation and things that were different was very, very narrow. Um, but he was smart enough to be able to make jokes that would make people laugh if that makes sense but that's kind of where it ended like beyond making a joke out of it he didn't have any other kind of thoughtful insights on any of those things and I think without being an apologist for Mark at any time when he takes a piss on that tree you know that I think is an honest mistake right but the reaction afterwards speaks to how insensitive and problematic Mark is as a human being because anyone else who was made aware that they'd made that error would be, I mean, mortified and would be apologizing endlessly. And he's like, I'll fucking get it. It's a tree. What? Sure. Like, he doesn't understand, like, he just doesn't possess that sort of level of compassion or sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And, um, Again, it's something that causes you to kind of laugh at him as opposed to, to with him. No one yeah. else is like, yeah, it is a bit ridiculous. You know, yeah. people, are, people are, are, I think, shocked and or laughing at him being a kind of a bit of an idiot. That's an interesting thing, like the idea of laughing at him but not with him, because it seems like uh, there's been a little bit of pushback in terms of categorizing or characterizing Mark as like the comedic relief in this movie. Right. Um, but he does do things that people laugh at so where, where do you sort of draw that line in terms of, I mean I guess comedic relief maybe just has like a it's too simplistic right 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 yeah no I mean I, I don't I don't um, reject that you know I think in, in some ways he is kind of comedic relief but I I just think that for me personally I mean um, I wouldn't push back against that but I would sort of say that I think it's it's important to obviously not overlook where he's kind of Problematic and regressive, and how that contributes to a, a a kind of instinct to laugh at him as opposed to with him all the while. Because sure. I think on occasion, Mark is sort of pointing things out that you're like, you know, that maybe he is kind of being the voice for the for the audience mm -hmm. in, in some respects. But then, um, you know, often he's laughing where it's really insensitive, or, or sorry, he's making fun of things in a way that's really insensitive and really kind of um, sort of disrespectful. And and I think on those occasions you're encouraged to laugh at him so it's it's probably a mixture of both but but more the more the latter than yeah. the former yeah um i know you've mentioned in the past couple of years that you're being you're making like a, a real effort to be more conscious about the social applications of your work and what sort of messages that you're contributing to putting out in the world mm. and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about midsummer in that context like why did its messages resonate with you and, and what are you hoping that people take away from this film yeah um so I think for me, from a creative standpoint, just artistically, I think to be part of a film that was so kind of ambitious and, and, and daring um, meant that its social application was going to be characterized by, um, you know, offering people an experience that differed from a lot of the other things that were kind of available to them. Um, and, you know, I mean, you know, when you think carefully or you, you make an effort to think carefully about the social application of your work, you don't necessarily, you know, gravitate towards things that are going to disturb people or upset them. Um, I think this was a very, very clever 
uh, film as far as how it encourages people to think carefully about how they treat other human beings that they're in a relationship with, be it a platonic relationship or a romantic relationship. So I think it encourages kind of um, introspection and I think very kind of interesting discussions about human psychology and empathy for other human beings. Mm -hmm. I think empathy is kind of... um, often at the root of a lot of problems that you know sort of humanity faces yes. so uh, so a film that explores empathy really appealed to me and then also playing a character that for me is a sort of poster child for the out of touch regressive male you know I felt like by playing Mark I was given an opportunity to make an example of someone who we shouldn't really al- allow to kind of continue to exist and have a voice in society yeah. like Mark is the kind of the sort of male that feels like well past their sell by day, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, so that 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 was kind of maybe the things that informed my, yeah. my involvement. Um, this script, this story, is not a typical horror story. So I'm just curious about your reaction when you read it for the first time. Yeah, I was so excited by the fact that it was so different, and I couldn't easily box it. You know, like there were things in the script that sure kind of rang bells that belong to the kind of horror house but then other things that felt like a kind of really sort of detailed and and very kind of emotionally dense sort of family drama Mm -hmm. and then you know a kind of painful almost like a painful romantic comedy um at times um it was it was so layered and um, it kind of branched off in so many different directions, but um, unique. There was nothing like it. I'd never read a script that had made me feel that way, and I've never watched a film that has made me feel this way. Um, so just to be part of something that felt so fresh and different was exciting. Mm-hmm. And the only sort of hesitancy that I had around being involved was a fear that there wasn't anyone who could execute, you know, this mm-hmm. this story. And I read it before knowing who Ari was. Then I watched his short films, and I was like, oh, this might be the guy to do it. And then I watched Hereditary, and I was like, oh, he 100% is the guy to pull this off. Yeah. And, and he did, you know, so I'm very grateful. I'm really grateful to Ari that he allowed me to be a part of his film. Awesome. Well, yeah, it's, it's great, man. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate it. Time. No, it was a great Thank interview. You. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. And finally, here is my conversation with Jack Rayner, who plays Christian. Before we really dig in, I, I want to talk quickly about that shot in which your character Christian is cradling Danny after she finds out about her family's death. That must have been a, a largely a, overlooked shot. Yeah, it must have been like a pretty <laughs> intense thing to be in Florence's presence when she was so vulnerable like that. Yeah, um, and Florence and I have a great relationship, a very warm relationship. You know, we're close friends and. Um, one of the really difficult things in filming Midsommar was that she's suffering for so much of the film and she's so committed as an actress um, that you can really feel the pain when she does it and that film in per- that moment in particular that you're talking about I just remember her lying in my lap and just screaming and I was so upset by it. I, I'm really, I was really crying there. I'm like, I'm really crying at that moment. Yeah. Just, just feeling the the weight of emotion that she was portraying in that moment. It was just, it became very, very real for me. You know, yeah. but it's a testament to her as an actress. She's just absolutely phenomenal. I don't know if there's anything she can't do. Yeah, um, your character Christian, he he sort of finds himself in a tough situation in this relationship and I've heard you talk about how you didn't want to portray him as just this sort of like a one note jerk but you and Ari worked to really give him some extra layers of dimensionality and mm-hmm. and what kind of conversations did you have about how you could add those extra layers to that character um well we talked about some of my previous films actually um you know there was one movie that I did in 2012 with Lenny Abramson called What Richard Did uh which you know that film is about it. It's 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 based very loosely on something that happened in Ireland twenty years ago, um, but it's about a young man who goes to a private school and he kicks one of his peers to death in a drunken fight one night accidentally, um, and finds out that the kid has died the following day and is suffering with the guilt, but nobody knows that he did it, um, so. It's a, it was a difficult character in that that's somebody who an audience could very, very easily 
just right off altogether. Yeah. Um, and I, I, the response to the film was such that people actually really empathized with him. And so we were taking something of that um, and trying to inject it into this character of Christian, but in the context of being a failing partner in a dissolving relationship, you know? Um, so that's something that I kind of try and do with all my roles, really. I've never played an out-and-out -out antagonist. I've never played a, a, a real, just pure villain, mm -hmm. I think, except maybe in Free Fire. <laughs> But every 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 film that I do, I'm really trying to empathise with the character and put myself in their shoes and think about how I would feel if if it was me, um, and that's that's the case with Christian too. There were a lot of scenes that were omitted from the final cut of the film that showed a more compassionate side to the character and a more engaged and involved side, um, in some moments of Danny's need, but. I think for the sake of the narrative and for the kind of payoff at the end of the movie, they didn't make the cut. Yeah. And you were talking about the guilt of, of Christian. In a certain way, a certain point in the movie, I guess, that guilt almost gives way to this like uh, hypnotic state, which mm -hmm. I guess brings us to your big sex scene in the movie. And, yeah. and the film foreshadows that moment in several different ways, but I'm curious about how you guys spoke about his, Christian's intentions and desires versus the trance-like state that he finds himself in well that's moment. as a result of drugs you know like the you know so she gives him a thing to drink and stuff <laughs> so that's where the trance sort of comes on and it's a trip it's a heavy psychedelic trip that turns into a really bad trip mm -hmm. um his intentions and his desires if, just can you hear well there are just context? sort of like moments throughout the movie where he's sort of you know, he clocks that this girl yeah. likes him, and yeah. he's obviously having some trouble in his own relationship. So yeah. I was just wondering, you know, how you guys struck that balance between finding, uh, finding the empathy in Christian. You know, making this like a a little bit of a moral gray zone where it's not yeah. necessarily. I mean, that I he, think part of that is you know that yes, he. I think that the character in the, you know, in the first kind of two acts of the film. You know, as we say, like he's he's insensitive to Danny, and he's trying to break away from the relationship, and probably also feels some of the shame and guilt of being inadequate in her moment of need, um, which I think allows for him to kind of go on a path of just like you know, just like breaking away from her and trying to find his his autonomy from her, basically. Um, and and this character Maya is a part of that. She's part of that kind of manifestation. Um, but he doesn't make any moves on her, and he doesn't really engage fully until the point where he's drugged right. by these people, and he's actually led there to the door. So there is a kind of a moral gray area there, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know what more to yeah, say about yeah, that. That's great. Um, what was your reaction reading about that sex scene for the first time? <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. That was really why I wanted to do the film because um, it's not the kind of thing that you encounter every day, especially in you know contemporary cinema. Sure. Especially not in something that's going to open wide, you know. Um, so what I was really interested in was flipping on its head the culture of um, exposing uh, female actors in scenes, you know, in these like really humiliating death scenes that you see in a lot of slasher films, mm -hmm. you see in like, you know, like The Last House on the Left is the one that I keep coming back to but also like, you see it as a kind of pervasive culture in like giallo cinema, the Italian, you know, horror movies like Dario Argento Lucio Fulci Lamberto Bava, like all these guys, it's something that occurs in all their in all their films too. So that's been that's just been the way things have been mm -hmm. for the longest time. And for me, having an opportunity to put myself as a male actor in that position and to experience something of the you know humiliation of it and the the you know the kind of turmoil of it, um, that was that was kind of the hook for me, you know, yeah. and it was difficult. Yeah. Um, I wrote something down in my notes when watching the movie, and then I saw that you mentioned the same thing in a different interview, and that's the idea of how far are we willing to go 
in these unfamiliar traditions before we decide that a line has been crossed. Mm -hmm. And I know that the, this movie takes that idea to the extreme, but the core idea there is pretty grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. And, you know, I think there are two elements that speak to that in the film. And one is the comedy and the other is the folk element. The comedy is something that Ari and I spoke about a lot before we even went into production and we both, you know, we're kind of, we're big fans of this British satirist, Chris Morris, who did Four Lions, I don't mm. know if you saw that film, but he also did a great satirical kind of prime time TV show called Brass Eye and it was very funny but it was on the membrane edge of what's comedy and what's really, really serious mm. and, you know, obscene basically. Um, and so like we always kind of knew that we were going to go there with this film and that we were going to try and inject a lot of gallows humor into it because what that does is it forces an audience to really have to think about what they're laughing at you know and to and to you know assess with themselves and check back in with themselves about whether what they're watching is really funny or whether it's actually horrifying mm -hmm. and similarly the folk element um you know, we're talking about pre-Christian traditions here and trying to delve into that. These these are traditions that are basically like pagan traditions are, are pre, that's prehistory, you know, at a, at a certain point. So with that, all of what we know and understand about our social structures and our moral codes is suspended. And you're sitting there as an audience kind of in uncharted waters and you're having to decide moment to moment what again what's acceptable and what isn't yeah. how how much are we on board with this and how much is it is it actually a, you know like an offense to us yeah for sure um i think i probably have time for one more question and that is that my wife and i both love sing street and ah, thanks, the, man. the moment with you celebrating at the end of that film really <sighs> just gets me every time when right. brendan is just so joyful about his younger brother like taking this huge leap in his life do you have any favorite memories from that production everything about that was amazing man like coming home after I don't know four or five years of working working abroad and um, on a lot of you know American productions and a lot of you know continental European productions coming back to shoot that film was a real homecoming and uh, I just loved every moment of it and it was obviously a very personal film for John Carney and it's kind of semi-autobiographical so I was honored to take on a role that was based on you know somebody who was very close to him and and it was also somebody who I kind of related to a lot as well through mm -hmm. my own experiences with my family so um yeah everything about that movie was beautiful man I do you share it. Brendan's feelings that no woman can ever truly love a man who listens to Phil Collins <laughs> I like Phil Collins <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much for your time I appreciate it thanks Congrats again on the pleasure to meet you you too all right, so hopefully you guys enjoyed those interviews. Uh, where can we find more of your work online? HT, let's start with you. You can find me writing every day at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at HTranBui. Chris? Uh, I'm also at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at SeaEvangelista413. Jacob? Uh, SlashFilm.com, and on Twitter at Jacob S. Hall. I am on SlashFilm.com as well. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ben Pears, and you can find more about all of the stories that we mentioned on today's show at SlashFilm.com and linked inside the show notes. SlashFilm Daily is published every weekday, bringing you the most exciting news from the world of movies and TV, as well as deeper dives into the great features you can find on the site. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps, and send your feedback, questions, comments, and concerns to us at Peter at SlashFilm.com. Please make sure to leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention your email on the air. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. That really does help us out a lot. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we will talk to you next time.